Sky Experts has worked with hundreds of funds, including hedge, private equity, venture capital, and broker dealers. As a firm, we pride ourselves on customer service. So we are always trying to bring value to our clients and friends in the industry. The reason we wanted to put on a webinar today covering the topic of raising capital is because whether we are talking with a $1 million new launch or a fund that has a billion dollars under management, the questions that always come up are, how do I raise capital? What does the perfect pitch book look like? And how do I meet with money allocators? Well, over the past few years, our firm has many great relationships with experts in this industry, like Lisa Vioni at Hedge Connection and Holly Singer at HS Market. Our clients who have worked with Lisa and Holly have given us tremendous feedback. So we wanted to share their knowledge and insight with you today. They are both very good at what they do, so hopefully you find this webinar useful. Please submit any questions you have, and we will do our best to address them during our Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Now I would like to introduce you to Holly Singer at HS Uh, this is Holly Singer. Am, am I on? Yes, you are. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you all for uh, participating in this webinar, and uh, special thanks to uh, Steve Vlasic and his team at Richie May for uh, inviting us and, and making this possible. Um, what I'd like to do uh, in, our, in our time allotted is to uh, share some communication best practices as well as some um, uh, takeaways, both uh, positive and negative, including some traps to avoid. Um, and also mention that what, um, what we're discussing today should be applicable whether, as Steve said, you are a uh, pre-launch, actually you could be before launch um, or just launching, or even a more well-established firm. So uh, hopefully these, uh, some of these comments will, um, will apply as well. Uh, let's start on uh, branding because that's actually one of the areas that many fund managers have um, have not paid a lot of attention to, but could certainly benefit from um, from pursuing. And I, I'd like to think there are really three main questions that investors are looking for, uh, each of which will um, help you build your brand. So the first here is um, who are you, and what that means is really not just you know, um, what kind of uh, results do you provide in terms of your um, portfolio, but who are you as a firm, um, who are you as a person, your pedigree, your team, what do you bring to the table, and then what do you do? So investors really need to understand with some level of granularity or perhaps it's um, the attribution of your performance, what is your strategy and try to explain it as well as possible, distill what might seem complex into really layman's terms. And then just as importantly, building your brand is really about explaining your value proposition. What sets you apart? What differentiates you? So if you're a long short fund and you're one of maybe two, the rest of the uh, two thirds of the investment universe, you may have more of a uh, challenge in, in terms of articulating what sets you apart. But that's where some competitive analysis comes in, some um, real deep um, you know, uh, thought on you know, what could it be about either your team or something uh, different about your firm that you can um, articulate. Uh, just as importantly, branding is not just about what you offer, but it's about how you want to be perceived. Branding is really perception. And all too often, many managers um, are just uh, reflecting on what they do, but, but not with the nuances that will enable investors to really um, you know, perceive them uh, as a, a leader in their field or different from the rest of the pack. So branding is a process. It's, it's not just creating a logo and, and slapping it on your letterhead or your, your website. It's, it's really a whole process about um, the messaging side um, of your firm. So that jumps right into um, um, what we have here, 10, ju just to kind of uh, give you the, the overview. We're, we're going to just um, run through 10 best practices 
and then uh, 10 traps to avoid. So um, what we have here is number two in the list uh, is five P's that are very easy for people to remember. Um, you know, the people is the team. The philosophy is really the rationale for what you, why you do what you do. It's the we believe. Um, the process is all too important um, as investors need to know there's a sustainable process um, and that's one of the critical parts of the message that uh, needs to be articulated from how you generate ideas through allocating assets, putting together your portfolio, risk management, exit strategy on, on trades where that's applicable and of course, um, of course performance, how, how you've done. Um, with your returns. And I'd like to just mention that the performance, if possible, should be presented analytically so that you um, uh, compare yourselves to um, a benchmark, to some indices, um, as well as provide some kind of a description of what, um, what has occurred. Instead of just dumping a bunch of uh, data points, it should always be presented analytically. And um, that's where I like to focus on qualitative message points. Uh, it, it's easier to be memorable if you can describe something qualitatively to an investor than focusing on the data. So the qualitative information is the first four of those five P's. And um, it, it's helpful to explain the opportunity set. I think that might not be done all that often, but for example, if you're uh, investing in a strategy that has um, some, uh, some macro elements that are particularly timely in today's market environment. Explain that opportunity set. Why is this a good time? Why is now a great time for your prospect to consider your strategy? Give them the parameters of uh, what should draw their attention. And really focus on your value proposition because again, um, if you're one of the uh, two-thirds uh, of the um, the marketplace, it's much more challenging to, to stand apart, but you do need to um, show those competitive advantages. Packaging your business. Uh, you know, many managers um, haven't focused as much as in, in other industries, but packaging your business um, is not something that needs to be a huge cost undertaking, but it should be taken seriously and it should be with your financial commitment, the way you've made commitments to other service providers, you um, should engage some level of professionals uh, to, to help you uh, communicate what you do, um, both verbally and visually. So your message should be tight and visually it should be aesthetically pleasing. We're not talking about museum quality artwork, but, um, but it should be visual. And what that means is having um, good flow charts for your process, for your risk management, and some other things, as opposed to just um, uh, just just words. So um, once you've put together a package, I, I think it goes without saying that consistency is important. So I'd just like to suggest that managers all um, utilize that professional branding and packaging across. Um, their pitch book, their website, their due diligence questionnaire, um, you know, their, their you know, uh, letterhead, every, every element that goes into what I call outbound communication uh, should look, look alike and sound alike. And that actually even ties into if you're at a meeting and you have, um, there's a few people from your team, everyone should have a consistent message, the, the importance of staying on message is right there. So you only get one chance to make a first impression, make it a great one. What's the best time to do this and to get your marketing toolkit ready? Before you're in prime time. So prime time is asset raising, even if it's with friends of the family, with the low hanging fruit, with the first few people that you're turning to. Since you only get one chance to make that impression, don't wait until you've already pitched what you do to them. Take them as seriously as the people that you don't really know. So um, I would recommend having all of that ready as early as possible. And it's not necessarily a one-shot deal for the life cycle of the firm. Um, you know, we, we often get asked to help upgrade or update information. So um, you might do one thing before you launch and then a little bit later on, uh, after you have some investor feedback or you've been out at conferences or um, raising capital, um, you know, time for a little bit of a, an upgrade. Just a few quick uh, pitch book 
tips from uh, over the years. Less is more. Um, the boat anchor, 30, 40, 50 slides. Forget about it. <laughs> um, keep them under 20. And uh, the first three slides are critical. So if you don't get the, um, the overview and competitive advantages uh, in the first three slides and you have those sitting in back, move them up front. Just make sure that all that information is way up front. What is a headline approach? <clears throat> Just as if you were reading a, um, you know, a newspaper, whether it's online or a digital version, sometimes in a rush, you only read the headlines. So those are your takeaways. So just make sure that each of your slides has a takeaway. What would someone who's looking at that slide for two seconds need to know? Or since you're in charge of branding, what do you want them to know? So just make sure that you put that in some kind of a, a headline format. Um, when it comes to performance, make sure that you have a caption because I think all too often we expect um, you know, the, the person or our audience who's looking at information or hearing us to understand maybe they don't and maybe they don't want to ask questions. So answer their questions by way of giving them what is the analysis? What is the takeaway? Just write a little caption to explain. If you have, for example, a VAMI chart that <clears throat> outperforms two indices, put that in, that's a caption. Um, so give them the explanation and the actual chart. Uh, make sure your visuals are clear. And the whole presentation, of course, should be uh, attractive. And that's part of your commitment to, to building your brand. So while we're marketers, we're not, um, you know, we're not legal advisors. I, I would like to stress that managers should, and I always recommend that managers get uh, their legal or compliance advisors to, um, to, to weigh in on their presentations, make sure you get approval uh, before you are uh, going into prime time, before you're in an outbound communication mode. So uh, make sure that you are, uh, your deck and your website are finalized and good to go with your uh, legal or compliance advisors. So um, we've talked a little bit about uh, being understood with a good message, um, but being heard and being seen are important. So what we have here is um, what some people have called traditional is the hand-to-hand -hand combat, going around with one, you know, one pitch book at a time, one meeting at a time, versus modern marketing, which is getting out there, cast, what I call casting a wide net. So um, the confluence of those two is where we want to be. So to be heard and be seen once you're ready with your, your tools uh, is a process. It's not a one-time project. It's a process. So part of that process is to be a thought leader. And uh, in the next part of our discussion today, Lisa Vioni is going to talk a little bit more about what that involved, involves. But I would just like to uh, leave you with the idea that seeking thought leadership opportunities are a great way to be heard and seen in a meaningful context where you could become the go-to person, where you could be the credible source for your strategy. And how does that um, you know, I, I, how does that work in terms of um, uh, what information is out there? It's an article, it's a white paper, it's a video, multimedia content always has higher impact, um, speaking engagements. Those are all channels and venues and ways for you to obtain thought leadership. So beyond just creating a marketing deck, um, those are great opportunities to be heard and seen, and those work hand in hand with um, PR initiatives. So if you do have, for example, if you write an article about your strategy, don't just put it on your website. Do put it on your website, but go further. So PR initiatives would enable you to maybe share that selectively with some uh, industry press because earn press, if they can cover you or want to cover you, um, will reinforce your credibility. And then also using social media channels, which of course in today's world or our key will enable you to um, be heard and seen on a on a wider basis so there are some other ways to also take advantage of modern marketing uh lisa's going to speak much further but um the hedge connection platform is a very robust offering and a way to actually take your marketing tools and also meet people but i'll leave the rest of that to her and just jump in for a couple minutes not to end on a negative, but I think it's useful because from my uh, actually two decades in this business, I've seen a lot and heard a lot, and a lot of common mistakes can be avoided. So let's just bang through these, these mistakes. 
uh, you know, managers often jump right in um, without a real strategy. So try to kind of embrace the idea of having a strategic plan and a process on how you're going to communicate, what to do first, next, and, and approximately when. So number two is a really, really big deal. It, it's one thing to have a great message. It's another thing to determine what to say in one to two minutes when you meet someone, whether you've uh, not been seeing that, whether you haven't seen them in a long time or whether you've never met them. That elevator pitch should be no more than two minutes and it should introduce you, your firm, your strategy, and your product in two minutes maximum. I would urge everyone, everyone to have an elevator pitch before you um, embark on asset raising. And then waiting too long to develop your collateral, um, you know, there's no time like now. We've talked a lot about, a lot about the um, need to articulate your edge. Um, and I've heard allocators at conferences say that they have decided to check the box of avoiding uh, further meetings with the manager because they didn't have a well-articulated edge. I think I heard one say unclear edge or edge unclear. You don't want to be in that boat. Um, so the rest of these are, are you know, pretty straightforward. Know what your, know what your uh, competitors are doing. Uh, number six is probably a surprise to some of you, but it's extremely common and disappointing. If you have any type of marketing collateral, whether it's your, your deck or your um, uh, you know, investor report or an investor letter or anything that you're sending out that doesn't have a very, very easy way to find you, um, you're undermining your, your opportunities. I would caution everyone not to be a fair weather marketer. It's actually very common. Managers say, oh, I'm in a drawdown, so I'm just, I'm sort of laying back. I'm in the shadows. Don't do that. That's, that's not productive for you. Make sure that you lead your pitch with qualitative information because the data points will go in one ear out the other, but something that's really memorable about you or your team or your business is more likely to resonate and, and to stick. Uh, with them. Engage uh, you know, yourself in, in modern marketing and, and PR. And don't, don't wait until you reach that three-year magic uh, you know, uh, track record time period or a certain number in the AUM uh, for your targets because um, you'll um, lose time. So what I'd like to do, so that concludes the uh, initial part of our discussion today. Uh, we're trying to stay on schedule. What I'd like to do is turn the, re the next segment over to my colleague Lisa Vioni and, sh and then we will also have some, some Q&A after that. So. Okay, thank you Holly. Um, uh, thank you for that introduction and for going over those steps. That um, I'm going to show my screen now. Um, so I'm going to now walk you through, um, kind of take you to the next stage of what you do after you have your marketing collateral, you've got your pitch down, uh, you've rehearsed this, um, you know what your methodology is, you know what your edge is, and you're able to now go out and start to talk to investors. You've made a commitment to your business, um, you have the proper infrastructure, um, and so on. And, and, and we're going to talk about how do you get in front of investors and, and then how do you build that relationship to ultimately, hopefully, raise capital and take your business to the next level. Um, so before we jump in, um, I just want to point out some challenges of capital raising. And I want to let you all know that I have been there um, on your side. I have raised money for uh, a startup hedge fund and I've raised money for a, meet, a big a multi-billion dollar hedge fund and, and a very, very big, large, multi-billion dollar hedge fund. So I've done all of the above, and I can tell you that for all of them, it's equally as difficult. The only thing that's easier when you're dealing with a very, very big company is that it's easier to get the meeting. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that in my own personal experience to try to help um, give you some hope uh, that there is um, a way for you to, to get out there and raise money. I'm also going to show you some statistics from some um, interviews that have been done uh, by Deutsche Bank um, and Goldman Sachs that go over what investors are looking for and give you um, some hope if you are an emerging manager 
um, that there are a lot of investors out there that are interested in you. So first, the challenges of raising capital, obviously there are the regulatory and compliance obligations. Even though we have gone through the JOBS Act, it, it, there still are advertising restrictions and Reg D considerations be, because if you haven't checked the box for 506B, you cannot, you still can't publicly advertise and make a public solicitation. So that's something that you have to be aware of. Um, uh, it's, 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 um, it's, it's, it's not obvious, but you can't go, while you should use LinkedIn, as Holly was talking about, for your thought leadership pieces, um, which are going to be generic and about the uh, market, you don't want to go on LinkedIn and you don't want to start talking about your performance and things like that because that will put you in a, in a bad position, possibly put you in a position of lo losing your private placement status. Um, the other issue, institutionalization, driving capital to mega funds, you know, how do you get the piece of the pie? Um, the difficulties for small emerging funds to raise capital, the chicken and egg syndrome. Um, third parties out there that you're talking to or you might want to engage to help you um, raise capital, you know, they provide both solutions but also problems. Um, relationships are critical, but how do you meet these investors? And then, of course, the barriers to entry are a lot higher now than they were 10 years ago or even, um, you know, b before uh, Bernie Madoff and other frauds that happened and Lehman Brothers um, going bankrupt and so on. All of these issues have caused um, allocators to require more infrastructure, and as a result, um, they have much higher barriers to entry and they've increased their operational due diligence requirements. So I'm going to talk a little bit about operational due diligence or ODD. Um, so just moving, moving to the next slide. Um, for some reason my slides are Okay, so one of the things that you want to do to differentiate yourself and to be able to start building relationships with investors is to, to develop a thought leadership capability. And what that means is you want to establish yourself as a trustworthy expert in a given field. You want to become an influencer, a thought leader, basically a provider of value. Now, if you can make your these people that you're talking about, that, talking to that you would like to invest with you, if you can make them smarter, if you could make them look at you as the go-to person in the industry for being the expert in whatever it is that you do, um, then when they have a question about your strategy or about your sector of the market or when they're ready to make an allocation and they still have questions, guess what? They're going to turn around and call you and ask you um, because you have made a point of over the – months that you've been building this relationship, communicating with them about things like market trends in general. You might talk to them about specific trades that you're working on. You might, uh, you know, talk about background and experience. Um, when you're writing um, letters to the investors, you want to write to them so that um, you, you don't want to write like you're sounding like you're marketing something or trying to sell your fund to them. You basically want to talk to them about uh, what you do generally um, and specifically the market and where the opportunities are. So I can tell you, for example, me personally, my own personal experience as a marketing person, I'm a specialist in mortgage derivatives. So when I was marketing mortgage hedge funds, what I would do is I would get on the phone with the potential investor and I wouldn't start with, hey, um, guess what? We were up you know, 2% last month and last year we were up 20% uh, net. And when, you know, you've been watching me for a year now, when are you going to write a check? Um, I, I almost never did that um, because that's not productive. What's productive is to make that call and to say, you know what, I just wanted to give you the heads up. Did you see the recent, you know, housing market numbers that came out? Um, we think that what that means is X, Y, Z. And, in fact, the way that we're implementing that in our portfolio is like this. So we think that over the next three months, because of this and because of these types of securities that we're buying, and because we think that prepayments are going to do this, that, or the other thing, that our portfolio is going to do that, okay? And I just wanted to give you that update. I think it's important that you understand, you know, what's going on in the mortgage market. And if you have any questions, please, you know, feel free to ask. So I would be um, consistently um, 
talking to my potential allocators about things like that, about the market, what's going on in the market, how does that relate to our portfolio, how is that going to, you know, how is our portfolio going to be affected by this? And, and by doing that over month after month after month of consistently doing that with prospective investors, I became somebody that they felt comfortable with coming to when they had a question about the market. And when they were ready to make that allocation, I knew it because we were in those conversations. Um, so that's really important. And, you know, how do you become a thought leader? How do you develop these capabilities? It takes a lot of time and it takes um, – a lot of thoughtfulness, um, but it's it's critical that you learn how to do that because that's where you're going to earn trust. That's where they're going to look at you and say, "Wow, um, th this guy really knows, or woman really knows what they're talking about," um, and they they want to make me smarter. And you know what? That's great. Um, so that's that's important. And we can talk about it a little bit more if you have questions about this at the end of the webinar. Um, the other thing that's really critical. Uh, this is, of course, um, new within kind of the past, uh, you know, post-crisis, is to have a strong operational culture. It's much, much more important now than it ever was before. And so I pulled out some um, some stats to, to show you. A, a Goldman Sachs survey stated that operational robustness ranked as equal to track record. Equal to track record. So it used to be people would say, oh, look, I've got this great performance. Why aren't they throwing money at me? Well, performance is no longer the number one thing that they're going to look at. Now, now, somebody said this to me recently, and it really resonated, which is they expect you to have good performance. That goes without say. If you don't have good performance, uh, why are you even in the business? Okay, so that's true. So you've got to have the performance, but you've got to have the operational robust, robustness to your business. Next bullet, according to PAMCO, PAMCO is a big, if you don't know who they are, a big fund to fund that on the West Coast started by a woman named Jane Buchan, um, and they look at emerging managers, so check them out if you don't know them. Uh, their operational due diligence teams hold emerging and small managers to the same standards as they do to larger, more established managers. Now, that may sound scary to you um, if you're an emerging manager, but that's, that's the way it is. Whether you have 10 million under management or 10 billion under management, PAMCO is going to say, to you, do you have the same types of um, infrastructure in place? And now some of this infrastructure can be outsourced as long as it's with a reliable third party, um, but you must have the different um, uh, components in place. A Deutsche Bank found that 70% of ODD teams interviewed stated that they now have explicit veto authority. That's huge. I mean, that, that is definitely a new phenomena that the, op, the ODD people that are coming in and doing these uh, operational due diligence meetings have veto power, power over and above what the CIO may say. That's important to remember. So what you need to know about that is if you get to the point where you're ready to have an operational due diligence meeting with an investor, don't go into it cold. Make sure you've prepared for that meeting. If you've never had one before, do a mock ODD meeting with somebody who, who is an expert at it and knows what is going to be asked because the one thing you don't want to do in one of those meetings is not know the answer to a question or, or trip over yourself because um, it, 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 the stakes are too high at that point. If you make a mistake and the operational due diligence team has an issue with you and vetoes you, the problem is in the next bullet you'll see that 63% of the investors said that they would never consider investing in a fund that their operational due diligence team had previously vetoed. So like Holly said at the beginning of her presentation, you get one chance to make um, that, to, to make an impression. Well, it's true once you're, as you're moving down the line with these investors, they're watching you as you're progressing in building a relationship. And when you get to the third critical moment of operational due diligence, you can't mess it up, so you really have to be prepared. Um, and the strong operational culture also is a reflection of the commitment you have to your business. You know, and they're looking at that. The, the allocators are looking at that. They want to see that you've made that commitment because they know that when you decide to put different things in place, that it has cost money, you've made an investment, but it also shows that you're not in this 
just to get that two and twenty. You're not trying to make that fast bus. You actually are committed to the business, and, and that's you know really important to them. Um, so, what are the top five reasons that investors will veto an investment? This is from um, the Deutsche Bank survey. The first one is a manager's unwillingness to provide adequate transparency. Twenty-two percent say that. So, what does that mean, transparency? You know, it's one thing. I, you know, again, I mortgage derivative specialist, so we can show our portfolio to investors. But guess what? It's really hard for investors to really make heads or tails of it sometimes. Like, what's an inverse IOT? And you know, I, what does it mean? Yeah, you twenty know, percent of your portfolio is that. That's, I mean, that's important transparency, but there are other types of transparency that they want to see, too. And so what, what's more important is to ask them, well, what do you need to see? What, what's important to you for transparency? Listen to what they say and really try to give it to them because at the end of the day, if, if, you, don't, if you can't give it to them or you don't want to give it to them, then you have to be willing to accept the fact that they may not give you an investment. And it, it goes both ways. Um, if you have inadequate or inappropriate compliance policies and procedures in place, you're going to have a problem. So you really have to take care to build those procedures out and compliance policies. Um, poor segregation of duties was one. So who's doing what within the organization? Uh, you need to know what everybody's role is, who's handling what, um, and be able to uh, explicitly define that to the allocators. Um, Inadequate personnel or lack of relevant experience in critical roles. So do you have your COO also being the CFO and the CAO? Like, are people doing multiple roles, and are they really adequately, um, do they have the adequate experience to really be able to do those roles? And if not, should you outsource one of those roles? Like, compliance is a good one. Should you outsource that to somebody who's an expert in it? Um, something you need to think about. And the last one, the fifth one, not the last, but the fifth one in this top five was inappropriate valuation policy. Um, so that, I mean, that's going to be um, more geared towards um, funds who have, who are invested in assets that are possibly less liquid and how are you actually doing your valuation, how are you getting, how are you getting the pricing, how many um, parties are you going out to, do you have a third party doing it to, to check and so on? What's your actual policy that you have in place? Do you have a policy in place? Um, so those, those two things that, that are important, <clears throat> that I think are hugely important, um, are to become the thought leader, figure out how you're going to do that, develop that, and be consistent with it, and make sure you have very strong operational due diligence or infrastructure uh, internally so that you don't get decayed by these allocators when you get to that very critical stage after building the relationship over the months and months and months that you've been doing it. So now I want to talk a little bit about the options for meeting investors. There are some options out there, but, but while there are options, they also have issues related to them. As we know, prime brokers have these cap intro groups, but you know, my question is, are you getting any service from them? A lot of the cap intro groups that exist for the prime brokers are really focusing on their top 10% of clients, and then 90% of their clients are not getting any cap intro service, even though we know when you're talking to them and they're courting you, they're, gonna, they're telling you that you're going to get cap intro. It's something that, um, that you really have to, I think, take with a grain of salt. I don't think you can rely on your prime broker to do cap intro. They've got a a lot of limitations to what they can actually do for you, and I think they over-exaggerate what they can do because they're trying to make the sale. So I think it's important for you to understand what the reality is and what they can really do versus like listening to a salesperson telling you what they can do. Um, and the truth is, is that really all they can do is, first of all, there are a limited number of people in these cap intro groups, so it's very hard for them to scale it up and to really be able to service everybody in the same way. They're a business, they want to make money, they're going to focus on their biggest clients. It's just the way it is. Um, and they're also going to focus on clients that have easier strategies to tell. And I'm just, I just know from my own experience working for mortgage hedge funds, I got very little cap intro um, love, um, even when I was at a very big firm, $22 billion firm. Um, it's hard. These, pe these 
people doing cap intro don't necessarily have a background in your strategy. They don't necessarily have a background in finance. They don't, you know, they're just doing cap intro. So, you know, the easier you can make it for them, if you do have any interaction with them to be able to tell your story, the more they'll focus on you. So you have to help them out too. Um, you don't want to just rely that they're going to go out and, and do that for you. You have to be a little bit of a, a pest, keep calling them, um, and bug them but in a nice way because, again, they do have limitations. They can't actually raise money for you. That's a misnomer. Um, all they can really do is make an introduction. Um, Third-party marketers, there are a lot of them out there. Um, I can tell you that um, there are really great ones, and then there are a lot of really not great ones. And there are a lot of pitfalls that you can have with third-party marketers. And that's a whole other – we can have a whole webinar on that. But you have to really be cautious when you're signing up with a third-party marketer about how you are, what your contract looks like, and, and what, you, what you're letting them do. You should try to be as structured as possible. Give them, you know, say to them, who are your top 20 um, uh, relationships? Let's start with that. See how they do. Um, kind of leg into the relationship because at the end of the day, they get paid when they raise money for you. They will try very hard for the first couple of months, and if they're not succeeding, guess what? You're going to fall off their radar screen. Even though your contract says they're supposed to be working for you for 12 months, you're going to be disappointed. So try to build a contract that gives you some flexibility and gives you the ability to kind of leg into that relationship. An internal marketing person is better, I think, if you can afford it because you have control over that person. You can watch what they're doing. Um, I understand that it takes more resources to hire that person, but if you can do it, you're better because you can bring somebody in, you can develop them, they can grow with you, and you have complete control over what they're doing, what they're saying, what the message is, and who they're talking to. Um, industry conferences, there are a million of them out there. I know because my company, Hedge Connection, has um, media partnerships with, with all the conference companies and we promote them all. We also host our own event. Uh, we're not a conference company, but we do one event. And I would say for an emerging manager or for managers in capital raising mode, the best use of your money is to find those, identify the conferences where you have a specific opportunity to be able to meet with investors, where it's defined, where there's that one-on-one -on -one component. Those events are becoming more and more um, popular, and you're seeing them um, you know, come up at, at a lot of different conferences. But it's not just a one-on-one -on -one component. You also want to look at the entire conference and see historically, like, who are they really catering to? Are they catering to, you know, bigger managers and bigger institutions? Or are they really catering to um, emerging managers or medium-sized managers? What exactly is the full program? What are they, what are they, what's their goal in their conference? And then um, make sure that, you know, you understand what the value what the value is that you're going to get at that conference. Um, you can purchase lists. I know everybody purchases lists. I don't purchase lists because I get um, hundreds of lists from these conference companies because that's part of my media partnership with them. Um, the thing with lists is lists. Once you get a list of contacts, you know, technically it's old news um, as soon as you get it um, because it's just a list. And for all we know some percentage of those people have moved on or changed firms or whatever. Um, and the other problem with lists is what are you going to do with that list once you get it? What are, you, are you going to do a big cold calling campaign, a big email blast campaign? There are definitely rules against that, just simple spam rules. But think of it this way. If you buy a list from one of the big companies that sells lists like Prequin, um, you buy the list for $5,000, what are you going to do with the list now? Um, are you going to start calling the investors on the list and marketing yourself? And what do you say when you call them? Hi, I just bought this list and your name's on the list and I would like to introduce my fund to you. It's, it's a little awkward and it's not the most professional way to go about starting a relationship. Recognize that those people that are on those lists that are being sold generally have not given permission for their name to be sold on a list. So it's you have to think about how it's going to reflect on you when you use the list. Hedge Connection is my company. I'm the CEO of Hedge Connection. I started it in 2005. Um, we, we are the first website to have an online um, platform where hedge funds, where managers can promote themselves to investors and get access to investors. 
So when you're using a product like Hedge Connection or some of the others that are starting to pop up now, it's, it's not a cold call. It's now a warm introduction. So the investors that I've accepted into my capital club on Hedge Connection, which is our premium service, when you request an introduction from that investor, they're waiting for your introduction request. They know that they're going to get it. They've opted in to be there. They've talked to me about it. They want to be there. And it's a much different experience for the investor than getting a cold call from a list. Um, Hedge Connections Capital Club, I just touched on it for a minute. It's, this, it's an online capital introduction service that we created. We launched it in December, although we've been doing this since 2005, um, just in, different, uh, in a different fashion. Um, we modernized it over the past two years and launched it in December. So now you can come on, join the Capital Club, review investor profiles, and just request an introduction. And when the investor reviews your information and decides that you're the right manager, they want to meet you and they want to start building a relationship, they will accept the introduction. Um, and that's, that is a premium service. You get charged for that introduction that leads to a meeting, but nothing else. There's no other back-end fees. Um, events. Um, so I said before, the one-on-one -on -one component I think is really important. We host the Global Fund Forum, which is an event that we do in June. This year we're doing it in Bermuda. We, we try to take a holistic approach to the event. It's not just one-on-one -on -one meetings, although there are 17 opportunities to meet with investors one-on-one. -on -one. You plan these meetings ahead of time using our proprietary scheduler inside Hedge Connection. But in addition to it, um, I have a lot of content that I offer, plus I have a pitch allocation competition, which is my version of Shark Tank, which is, which is a lot of fun. Um, I've got interactive workshops. I have people there who are giving free pitch coaching sessions. Um, I have um, a group called The Hub that's doing videotaped interviews. These other opportunities are not, they're just part of the experience of coming to the event. So not only are you getting the experience of meeting with the allocators, but you're also getting the experience of being able to get to learn and to become a better um, um, person that's spe marketer of your fund. So you're learning your, your, your pitch techniques, your marketing materials can be reviewed, you can uh, get interviewed and get a video that you can use for marketing purposes. So, um, you know, I think that our event is, is, a, is a pretty good choice. One of the things that I wanted to also mention is when you start the year, one of the things you should do is think about what are your goals for that year for marketing, what do you want to accomplish, and how much money do you want to dedicate to it. If you don't know those three things, it's going to be really difficult for you to put in place an effective marketing program over the course of the next year. So if you know that number, then you can back into, okay, how many events do I want to go to, where do I want to travel to, who do I want to identify, how do I want to accomplish these goals. Um, the one thing I said to Steve um, Blasnick from um, Richie May before we got on this call was um, because Richie May is sponsor of the Global Fund Forum and because he, he has put together this wonderful opportunity for everyone here to listen to this webinar, um, I would like to offer a special discount to the Global Fund Forum that is good for the next 48 hours where the, the price for you to participate would be $3,000. So that is um, a discount coming down from $5,500 down to $3,000. And if you want to take advantage of that, in the next 48 hours, you're welcome to do it. Just use the code WEBINAR in all cap letters. And so that is, um, you can thank Richie May for that. They are a sponsor. And because of their sponsorship, um, they have offered to subsidize for those of you who are on this webinar today. Um, so there's some, some good news for emerging managers um, from my research. And just from my experience of talking to investors, they're bullish on new launches. 43% of investors feel that the opportunity set for new launches in the U.S. is attractive. 68% indicated a willingness to invest with an emerging manager. Um, the, the, uh, the assets under management threshold was $76 million with a five-month track record, at least. Um, according to the 2014 Deutsche Bank survey, um, fund of funds remain some of the most active early stage investors with 79% indicating that they have invested or would consider investing within the first three months. Fund of funds. Fund of funds get a bad rap. Um, you should 
make sure you're talking to fund to funds because they will, many of them out there will talk to you. Um, some allocators, especially seed managers, specifically target early stage allocations and launch date funds. Um, when we looked at the willingness to invest in emerging managers, um, the minimum asset under management requirements for an investment average, um, when we, when this is from the Deutsche Bank survey from 2014, um, in, investors willing to consider emerging managers, if you look at all investors together, so 76 million was the assets under management that all investors generally if they were going to invest in emerging managers, wanted to see. High net worth people said 79 million assets under management, fund to fund said 78 million, institutional said 70 million. So it's right around that 70 to 80 million number. In terms of um, percentage of investors willing to consider an investment with an emerging manager with less than a three year track record, 66% will consider an emerging manager. So I know you're sitting out there because I get this question all the time. I'm small. Is it too early for me to start talking to investors? What should I do? And my answer is you have to start talking to – once you get all of your collateral down, you know your pitch, you're, you know your edge, and you're able to um, – and you have your operational due diligence, stuff, all of your infrastructure in place, you should start building relationships right away because there are a lot of investors out there that are interested in talking to you. But note. The, the cycle for building that relationship and getting the um, investment is long. It could take anywhere from three months to two years. Um, so here's another, another, um, you know, table that I think should give you some hope. Uh, do you or your clients invest early? Family offices are the, you know, at the top. Eighty percent said they would consider investing day one or within the first three months followed by fund of funds at 79%. So they're basically the same, family offices and fund of funds. Then you have investment consultants at 75%, um, private banks, wealth managers at 62%, endowments foundations at 58%, insurance companies 50%, and pension funds at 45%. So here are some essential tips when you're starting out. Don't wing it. Define your annual marketing, fundraising goals, and budget each year so that you know what you're doing and you can be thoughtful about it and you can actually at the end of the year you can go back and you can say did I what did I accomplish my goals and you can see your goal should not be I want to raise you know 50 million dollars this year it's just not realistic instead a goal should be I want to make you know 10 new in um, relationships with investors that are serious uh, relationships there's something I want to share with you in terms of what I've seen over my decades of doing this, raising money for um, startup and larger hedge funds, I said in the beginning, I've, I've raised money for three different hedge funds, um, three different, and one was a, had four million when I started, the other one had two billion, and the last one had 22 billion. So all different sizes. The numbers seem to be the same, regardless of the funds and size, which is this. For every hundred investors that I talked to that were Good investors, real allocators, um, where, where we were, you know, we had a good product to sell. I was good at describing my product. I was good at building that relationship. For every 100 investors, I would get two or three that would actually make an allocation. My last uh, money-raising job, I stepped down as CEO at Hedge Connection for a year while we were doing a pivot. I went to a big private equity firm and raised money for their RMBS fund. Took the fund from $800 million to $2.3 billion. In that year... To give you an idea of how hard it is, even at a big firm like that, I did 14 roadshows, met with or spoke with 400 investors. I got money from five. So it's not, it's not easy what you're trying to do. That's why it's critical that you put all these things that Holly and I are talking about in place to have success. Because if you don't put these things in place, if you don't have a commitment to your business, you're just making it that much harder for yourself. And if you really want to succeed, you, you, you just—it's too competitive out there to to not to not um, have all the your T's crossed and your I's dotted. Um, so you want to begin developing the thought leadership's role from day one. You want to build the strong business infrastructure with the right service providers. You want to communicate consistently with prospective investors and build trust. 
like Holly said, you don't want to, you don't stop communicating when your performance is not great. You have to, you, when, when you're having a bad month, you have to tell them why. This is critical. This is when this separates the men from the boys. Like, can you talk about why you messed up or what the problem was or why you're down clearly and effectively to make them feel comfortable? It's trust. It's about trust. You have to be able to do that. And get out there and start meeting with allocators before reaching that magic number. Everybody tells me there's this magic number, I don't know, 100 million. It looks to me like maybe 70 million is the magic number. But frankly, there's no magic number. You've got to start building the relationships right away as soon as you've got all that stuff done that we talked about because the process is actually very long. If you wait until you have 100 million or 70 million under management, you're going to be a year behind the eight ball. So start it before that happens. And then when you get to that critical number, that magic number, you're closer to getting that allocation. And so with that, I'm um, going to uh, – there's my there are my contact details, Holly. You'll be happy to see my contact details there. So if anybody has any questions, feel free to email me at info at hedgeconnection.com. And then I think we're going to now move to the Q&A session. I don't know if there's anything I need to do on this. Um, okay, can um, you're all set? Can we move to Q and A? Yes, yes uh, it works. Lisa, this is Holly. Why don't you jump in and just uh, grab a question? Okay. Okay, sure. Um, I know that some of you did send some questions before before the session actually happened. Um, so one of the things that somebody asked out there was, what marketing approach should a hedge fund with a good track record take when they're too small for prime brokerage cap intro programs and generally for institutional investors? Well, I think, you know, I, just, I don't want to reiterate everything I just said, but I, I, I think that you, the, the biggest thing you have to keep remembering is you're building a relationship and trust. Um, if you can separate yourself and be viewed as a thought leader, um, then you are going to really um, jump ahead in terms of building that relationship. Every time you call an investor, a prospective investor, you, what you want, your goal should be on that call is to make them smarter, to teach them something. It shouldn't, and teaching them something isn't that we were up 2% this month. Teaching them something is about your market, about your, inf even, it could be, we just hired another analyst. I wanted to let you know that this analyst is, you know, has this pedigree, did this, did that, and it's going to be making our business this much better because they're going to be doing this. Um, so um, that's the marketing approach you, you should have. You always have to have that in the front of your head. And um, again, for the prime brokerage cap intro, just you can't you can't rely on them. Understand that if you're small, you're just not, you're not going to get the cap intro that they promised you. But what you can try to do is build a relationship with one of the um, people doing the cap intro that's on the cap intro team, and try to get them from time to time to help you out. But you have to understand it's just if you're not if you're not bigger if you're not one of their bigger clients you're just not going to get the cap intro that they promised and unfortunately that's that's just the way that it is um holly do you want to step in and answer a question um sure so let, let me just jump into a very uh different question um which uh, wasn't specifically covered here and that was the question uh, as to whether or not it's okay to post ads in the hedge fund's own website, and there have been changes in regulations. So um, presumably that question applies uh, to the hedge fund itself, not to, I mean, I don't think anyone would want to or would plan to put other unrelated commercial ads that would undermine your branding and reputation and credibility. So I'm not sure about the question, um, but happy to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion with someone separately. Anyway, um, as, as most of you probably know, uh, the Jobs Act, which was signed in 2012, did repeal the ban on general solicitation. It became effective uh, toward year-end 2013 when the SEC adopted a new rule. So here's the wrinkle. Managers who want to um, post uh, their information on a website and engage in general solicitation 
do need to file their fund under the new rule, which is 506 now I'm not an attorney you do need to check with your legal counsel I know that some attorneys are reticent to make that recommendation for the new filing I don't understand why I think everyone should file under 506 C and be able to use modern marketing that we just talked about earlier but anyway that 506 C does open the door to general solicitation you know that more more transparent websites and what's called advertising without jeopardizing your Reg D exemption. The, the other wrinkle is you do need to, under the new rule, take on a very specific process to verify that all your investors are accredited um, in your fund. So my uh, cautionary advice is check with your legal counsel before proceeding, but do urge them to enable you to use the new rule. Okay, Lisa. Okay, um, somebody asked a question about seeding. Um, should you do it or not? And I think I think Holly and I are on the same page with this. I think you should. We should. We think you should do talk to, and do whatever you need to do to get your business in the, the next level. The truth is, is that you, you know you're 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 a small business, and you've got a certain amount of time um, to make your business work. And the sooner you can get capital. Um, and assets under management, the sooner you're going to be earning revenue and your business is going to be growing. Giving up part of that GP in the beginning is not necessarily a bad idea. Um, the, one of the, when I worked for Ellington, that's a big mortgage hedge fund run by Mike Reynos, he gave up um, a percentage of his GP for um, $100 million from the Ziff family. Um, and the, was able to grow that firm into a multi-billion dollar hedge fund. He did that from day one. But what he built into that structure, if you're going to take seed money, what you want to have is the option to be able to buy your management company back in seven years. That's pretty common. Most seeders will allow for that because they know that it's, it gives you um, a reason to really do well and to build your business, and that's what they want too. So I, I would not... Um, I think it's important to talk to everybody, and I think seed capital is is a is a valuable way to do it. I don't know, Holly, if you have anything else um, you want to well, add. Well, actually, that. since we're we're close to the end of the uh, time slot, Steve, why don't you and your uh, colleagues jump in on on the uh, the last question? Perfect. Um, another question that came in was, can you please explain what a performance examination is, and if you feel it's beneficial to have when you are in capital raising mode? And this is definitely an area of expertise. For Richie and May. You know, we complete about 30 or 40 of these a year uh, for the emerging managers we work with. You know, so I brought in my colleague, Eric Edson, who's an expert on this topic, uh, to kind of address this question. So, just real quick, from a high level, a performance examination typically takes place when someone's considering launching a fund structure, they've been trading their investment strategy in either a separately managed account or possibly in a personal trading account. A trader slash fund manager wants to use that history and track record in the Facebook and other materials to show the success of their strategy. Another purpose of having the performance examination is to have a public accounting firm sign off on the past performance history, which ultimately you know, will issue an opinion on that performance, stating that it's materially accurate. Typically, in the report, will show the strategy reported performance numbers you know, both a gross rate of return and a net rate of return, which includes, you know, hypothetical management and things. You know, as Holly mentioned earlier, you also see, you know, reports where the manager is going to include, you know, some relevant benchmark, you know, say the S&P 500 or maybe HFRI index. So from a capital raising standpoint, you know, I think we do feel it's beneficial for emerging managers to have a performance examination. You know, especially I'd say in this time where regulators are so highly scrutinizing performance. Thanks, Eric. Well, since we're running out of time, you know, we saw some other questions come in. We'll make sure to address those personally through email. You know, hopefully everyone found this webinar beneficial. If, if you have any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to contact us directly. You know, also, I just wanted to let everyone know we will be hosting another webinar in the next few months, and that'll include money allocators talking about capital raising from their perspective. 
I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the day and thank you for joining us.